This video is about section 2-2 of your book, which is about wheels. But the thing is, to understand how wheels work, we need to understand a lot of other different factors. Those include friction, work, energy, and power, and all of that leads to wheels. So I want to start by explaining friction using this simulation. If you look, there's two books, chemistry book and a physics book, and they're trying to show that the physics book down below, see how it's got these little trembling molecules on them? That's the way it really is. You've got these little tiny trembling molecules that cover the surface and of course go deep inside. Likewise, on the chemistry book, there's these little trembling molecules, and they're trying to show here that it's actually, it's a little uneven, right? Some of the molecules stick out a little further than others. If we took those two books and we rubbed the top one, I'm going to rub it against here, look at this. We actually increase the heat just a little bit by doing that rubbing. We can actually, oh, we can increase a lot. We can rub it so hard that we rub parts of it off. But we increase, we're basically adding kinetic energy in some sense into this system and that kinetic energy shows up as heat. We're actually making these things wobble even more and that doesn't show it very well but we kind of are making them wobble even more and that increases the heat. Now when it comes to friction there's actually two types, two types of friction. I think we talked a little about that before. One is static, when you're sitting still, and the other is dynamic. Oops, helps if I spell it right. Ah, it's very sad. Dynamic, dynamic or moving friction. Okay, so static friction is friction. You saw how the, the lower book had sort of molecules that stuck up like that. And then the upper book had, let's make that a different color, had molecules that kind of went down in there. Okay. So now, see how some of this is kind of, some of these molecules are sticking down in between the grooves here of the other item. So when you start trying to push, it catches, right? So, uh, um, let's see, we can say it catches. The first, the top book is the it and won't move. But what happens if you push it hard enough that it actually begins moving? If you think about it, what's what's going on is it it actually kind of pushes hard enough to ride up, or up on top, right? So it sort of gets out of the grooves. It's sitting up on top and it's moving along like that. And so because of that, it's moving on top, it doesn't catch, at least as long as it's moving and riding along the top, it doesn't catch. Near her. Why is this not writing? It doesn't catch. Let's see. It doesn't stick, and so Let's see, where'd my pen go? Here it is. I want something with a little thicker. Okay, it doesn't stick. And so it glides along more smoothly. Dynamic friction is lower. And static friction, of course, is higher or bigger. So let's draw a picture 
of a tire for just a minute. Okay, so we're going to have this is my tire and it has this sort of rubbery you know thing around it. It's got a rough surface. Okay, it's a little bit rougher than it should really be. And here we go. Here's the ground. So we've got the ground here. Oops, it's actually not touching. Let's try that again so that it touches. Okay, so we've got... Okay, so it's kind of touching. Can you see that you want static friction on a turning tire? Because if you have, you know, this little thing gripping from the ground and you've got your tire gripping onto the ground, the little grooves are, are sitting right in there, then it's got something it can push against. But if it was totally just as smooth as a little baby's bottom, as they say, then what will happen is that, that tire will come over there and it will just spin, right? And it won't get any traction and you won't move. So you do not want dynamic friction because that's just sliding, that's skidding, right? This, uh, you know, here's the tire just skidding, riding along. You want static friction which is where you, you still have a grip on the road. So let's go back to our forces in motion. Right, We have a crate here and let's see, I think I'm going to, well we know the crate has a weight, that's this FG, and it's got a normal force being exerted on it, so the weight pulls it down, the normal force is the ground pushing back up on it. If I change this surface so that it's now frictionless ice, what will happen is if I start pushing it, I'm going to apply a force and remember that, unfortunately I can't draw on that, so I'm going to draw right back here. I'm going to say F is equal to MA. If I apply a, a little pushing force, FA, going in a sideways direction, so going this way, it will accelerate a little bit. Now I just need to push it for a little bit, enough to get it accelerating. Once it accelerates to some velocity, then it'll keep going right at that velocity. There's, see, you saw I applied a little force. It just keeps going because there's no friction to stop it because this is a smooth ice right there. I'm going to send it. Okay, stop. Okay, so it's stopping. Now I'm starting an applied force the other way. Now let's go look at a frictional surface. Okay, so now we have wood right here on the uh, on the ground and so I have to push quite a bit harder to get it to start accelerating. Look at that. There's my applied force. Frictional force is opposing me. Okay, I'm pushing, 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 keep pushing. Okay, I pushed strong enough to overcome that applied friction and I let it go, but as soon as I let that little rascal go, what does it do? The frictional forces keep going, right? And so they um, eventually stop it. So let's see, look, you can see there's two types of friction. There's the static friction here and kinetic friction, and I can vary both of them. So notice naturally the static friction's higher than the kinetic friction the one that, that happens when we start moving. I'm going to lower this kinetic friction just a little bit, right, or actually quite a bit. So you can see now I have to push it pretty hard to get it started, but once I get it started I don't have to push it very hard at all and it actually just slides along because there's not much friction once I do get it started. So again, here we go takes a lot to get it going, but once I get it going, it, it actually, as long as it keeps going, the friction is, is kind of, is not too bad. But once it stops, it takes a lot to get it going, to get it out of those ridges so that I can keep pushing it. And then it's easy to push. So I can vary my, let's make our, okay, 
I'm going to make it so that the kinetic friction, oh, they won't even allow you to make the connection for, uh, connect, or the kinetic friction higher than the static friction. You're always, they're always, the worst case is that kinetic friction is just the same as static. Let's make our static friction really, this is a sticky surface, kind of like honey or something. Well, I guess worse than that, Velcro. Okay, I really have to push it hard to get it moving. And then, of course, the static friction is a little bit less. Now, let's see. If I, if I make this heavier, right, which in essence is what I'm doing by increasing the mass. Remember, the mass times g is actually the, the weight of this object. So notice that when I increase the mass, or decrease the mass, the forces of course change. Now let's go back here a little bit. Let's let's change it so it's pretty much uh, we're gonna reset it. Let's reset it. Come here, stop, clear. Okay, it's resetting right now. And let's make it so that if my object mass right now, if I push it. Notice I had to get around 320 to get it going. Right there, 324 is where it starts moving. Now, if I increase the object mass, if I make this a heavier item by increasing it, I will actually have to push even harder because this box is going to be more firmly into the grooves when I make it heavier. So I'll have to push it harder. Watch. Let's see. Okay, I'm past 320. I'm now at 3... I'm almost at 440 to make it because it was heavier, so it was harder to push. Now let's make this so that we're on the moon. Oh, well, obviously, the weight changes and the normal force changes because it's just the mass times g. And on Earth, or on the Moon, that G is smaller. So clearly, it's easier to push because it's not, it's not uh, deeply seated into the grooves. Now, we know that energy is, energy is always in joules at least if you're in the SI system. And one joule is equivalent to about the amount of energy it takes for the heart to beat one time. One heartbeat. And power is just energy being used in a certain amount of time. So we're used to watts, right? We calculate our power usage in kilowatts, and this is this is often what we uh, is the the general unit. If we want to think of it in terms of horsepower, we can do that too. We could say, in essence, that. If I can get my pen back, 746 watts is about one horsepower. And what's a horsepower? Well, you take a horse, you connect it up, and you, to 330 pounds of coal, you can lift that at about 100 feet in one minute. That's considered to be one horsepower or 746 watts. And the other way to think of it is simply that one joule used in one second is equal to one watt. Now here's something I've always found interesting. If you compare things, power is of course energy per unit time 
And I don't know why this is, but I think it's kind of magical. It's always a a through concept times an across concept. I don't know why this is. And I'll give you uh, an idea of what that is. Through, so a through concept might be like velocity times force. Okay, so you will see that power is always equal to velocity times force. That's one way to calculate things. So if we said something was moving at four meters per second and we had um, a force on it of five newtons, then we can say that the power is going to be 20 watts. You can kind of think of it as this way, in, in this fashion. Remember that work is equal to force through distance. So if we just say, well, what is power? Power is equal to work per unit time, right? Per unit time. Look, distance over time is velocity. So that's part of how we can get this idea of power is equal to force times velocity, which is actually what we have here. I just kind of rearranged it a little bit. Later, you're going to see the same sort of idea because we'll say electrical power, electrical power, which is just power, is actually going to be um, voltage times current. And so it'll be that through uh, variable and then the across variable. And so it's the same sort of thing. So let's say now that I have a little toy truck and it has a power of 100 watts on, to on your toy truck. And my little toy truck has this battery that's supplying 100 watts of power. That's how it's moving along. And it's moving at a velocity of, of 5 meters per second. What kind of force is being supplied to that little toy truck by this power? Well, clearly, we can just divide by 5 meters per second, 5 meters per second, and 100 divided by 5 is just going to be 20 newtons is the force supplied by those batteries up supplied to keep the toy truck running. Now just let's um, work two problems really quickly so you can see how easy these things are. Kinetic energy, we talked a little bit about that before. We know that kinetic energy is can be calculated by just taking our velocity, squaring it, multiplying it by the mass, and that gives us our kinetic energy just like it shows right there. So in other words, if I have a car, it's moving along at some velocity v, which is 3 meters per second, or sorry, meters per second per second. Okay, and I've got 200 kilogram. It's a small car. It's just a little go-kart. Okay, so I can calculate my kinetic energy by just saying that kinetic energy is one half times, well, this is 200 kilograms, so it's 200, and velocity squared, oops, 
oh, you should have stopped me. That's meters per second because that's velocity. So that is 3 squared. So we'll write this all out. 1 half times 200 is 100. 3 squared is 9. So this is going to be 900. And what are the units for kinetic energy? Joules. Now, if we wanted to work a problem like this backwards, we easily could. Let's say that I told you that something had mm, um, kinetic energy was 1,000 joules. And the mass was, mm, let's make it, 500 kilograms what is the kinetic or, or what is the velocity well we can just plug everything into our equation so let's go ahead and do that we know that ke is one half mv squared so plugging things in we're told that Kinetic energy is 1,000, so we've got 1,000 is equal to 1 half, and I said m was 500 times v squared. So what's, let's see, let's take everything around and rearrange it. So first off, 1 half of 500 is 250, equal to 1,000 times v squared. So we want to get this v by itself. So we're going to divide by 250, both sides. Divide by 250, both sides. So that becomes 1. And now 1,000 divided by 250, if you plug that into your calculator, that's 4 is equal to v squared. Are we done yet? No. We have to take the square root of both sides. So we'll take square root here, square root here. Square root of v squared is just v. Square root of 4 is 2. So only thing we need to add now is the units. If this is velocity, we know the units that go with velocity are meters per second. So we were able to take a problem. See, no matter what I give you with something like this, all I have to do is give you, there's three different quantities here kinetic energy, mass, velocity. If I give you two out of three, you can always plug them in and solve, you know, for the third, uh, the third quantity there. Now, the one other equation they give you in this textbook is the kinetic energy is equal to one half moment of inertia times the rotational velocity squared. Now what's with this? What's the difference between these two uh, e equations? They look almost the same. This is actually, uh, um, it is pretty much the same. It's just that if they give you uh, information that relates to these kinds of quantities, which usually involves something spinning, right? This is going in translational going kind of straight. This might be, for example, uh, a top, a rotating top that's got uh, kinetic energy affiliated with it. And in just a minute we're going to see something with kinetic energy in it. And if we have that top spinning, it's got the kinetic energy, how can we calculate how much kinetic energy we've got? Well usually people will give us for example, the moment of inertia might be hmm, 4 meters. Whoops. Let me write that again here. 4 kilogram meters squared. That's the units of this thing. So we might know that a top, for example, big top, has 4 kilogram meters uh, squared of um, moment of inertia. And then this, this is the rotational velocity, and we might be given something like, 
uh, two radians per second. So all we'd have to do is say if the um, the moment of inertia is four, and the um, so let me circle things here. So this is this I here is four, and the omega will make that be two radians per second and let's see we've got to square it so we're going to square it and then the kinetic energy of that top in total will be 4 times 2 squared which is 4 so it'll be 4 times 4 sorry about all of that so I'm going to say that's 4 times 4 is equal to 16 joules of kinetic energy in that top rotating and we're looking down on the top as it's rotating so we use this equation when we're given units in uh, in relation to rotational energy it's still kinetic obviously it's just rotating we use this when we're going with uh, translational motion Mostly, we'll use translational motion in this class, but I just want you to see this. And now we're going to see a little video related to rotational energy with tops, and then we'll go on to some friction. <laughs> oh, nice catch. <laughs>
Friction is a necessary evil of engineering life. In any assembly with moving components, both friction and wear will tend to occur wherever two surfaces move against each other. In cutting a material, engineers have to take friction into account. This is what it can do. The drill fails. You can see the effects of friction almost everywhere. On touchdown, clouds of smoke shoot from the tyres of this jumbo jet. It's because of friction between the tyres and the runway. Sometimes we rely on friction. In a chuck, for instance. And it's only friction which holds the taper shank in place. So, if friction is sometimes the enemy of efficiency, it's also a phenomenon we can't do without. This car can't stop because friction between tyre and road has been reduced by a film of water. This simple experiment helps us to understand more about friction. A surface plate looks perfectly smooth and flat, but when we try to push it across a steel bench top, we encounter some resistance. We get a kind of stick-slip motion. If we could look at these two smooth surfaces under a microscope, we'd see something like this, a series of peaks and valleys. The peaks rub against each other as one surface moves over the other. We can separate these peaks by putting a thin film of oil between the two surfaces. And of course, the motion becomes easier. So, one way you can reduce friction is by using a lubricant. You can make the motion even easier by putting rollers between the surfaces. Now it's much easier to move the surface plate over the bench. Though without friction, the rollers would slide instead of turning. It's even easier if we use ball bearings. Now we can move the plate around over the workbench with very little resistance. Though once again, remember, it's friction that makes the ball bearings roll instead of slipping. Does friction depend on the types of material in contact? This cube has four different faces. Let's put a plastics material in contact with a mild steel surface. It takes very little force to move the cube because it's a low friction material called PTFE. What about mild steel? More weight means more friction. Now brass. Even more friction. And lastly, copper. So friction depends on the types of material in contact. Whenever you try to move one surface over another, the force of friction will resist the motion. You have to apply enough effort to overcome that resistance. Obviously, you need more effort to shift a bigger load. 
But that's because the friction also increases if you apply any kind of downward force to the two surfaces. The bigger the load you apply, the larger the friction. And the more effort you need to overcome the resistance. Engineers make use of this basic principle all the time. For example, in work holding. By applying a large downward force to a clamp, you increase the friction between the work and the slideway making it more difficult for the work to slip during cutting. The design of a car brake relies entirely upon friction. Early cars, like this 1919 Wolseley, used a simple shoe brake design. When you applied the brake, a high friction material was forced against the wheel to bring it to a halt. Modern designs are rather more complex, but the principle is basically the same. The disc brake unit is mounted against the hub of the front wheel, with two pads of a high friction material inserted on either side of the disc. You can see the design more clearly on a diagram. When you apply the brakes, this high friction material is squeezed against the disc to stop both disc and wheel rotating. The harder the pads pinch the disc, the greater the friction. And this depends on how hard the driver presses the pedal. In this car, the force applied is measured on a dial. 400 units. This time, the driver will brake twice as hard. More force, more friction. Disengaging a clutch separates it from the engine flywheel so that the wheels are no longer driven. The clutch engages on the flywheel by means of high friction material on the back of the cone and transfers the drive from the engine to the prop shaft. A drive belt also relies on friction. Friction belts are used in a wide range of engineering situations to transfer power. When this belt is slack, the pulley on the left remains stationary. Adjust the tension and the drive is taken up because of friction between the pulleys and the belt. In work holding, it's again important to increase friction. You can do this by increasing the load on the work. With a surface grinder, you do this by using a magnetic force, as this demonstration shows. To show what happens without the magnetic force, we took the guard off and turned the wheel slowly by hand. Something you must never do. Though friction is sometimes useful, it's often a nuisance causing wear and inefficiency. For example, a car engine would seize up without oil. Machine tools are highly complex assemblies containing many moving and rotating components. To avoid wear on the slideways, friction must be kept to a minimum. All machine tools are designed with highly complex lubrication systems. Good design and lubrication of bearings is a fundamental contribution to the efficient running of any machine. This model steam engine has one of the commonest types of bearing, a journal bearing. It separates the drive shaft 
and the conrod. It's made of phosphor bronze, which is a softer material than steel, and it reduces wear and tear on both the drive shaft and the conrod. In this gearbox, the drive shaft has to take an enormous load, which means there's a lot of friction. Once again, a journal bearing is used. The sleeve contains a phosphor bronze lining, which is softer than the steel drive shaft. As these marks show, the lining tends to wear out first. In machine tools, good bearing design is of fundamental importance. This model shows the mechanism of a shaper. The up and down movement of the central bearing determines the length of strike. We overrode the safety lock on a shaper to show you the bearing in action. It's made of cast iron moving on steel runners. Friction between these two materials is fairly low and this factor combined with good lubrication keeps friction to a minimum. It's easier to move something on ball bearings than to slide it. By separating the components in a cage, friction between them is reduced. This exploded model of a car engine shows the ball bearings in the differential and you could find many more examples. Roller bearings are more effective for heavy loads. This one is on a test rig in a laboratory. Load is applied at the top of the bearing by a hydraulic system. Because of the load, friction will be greatest at the top and bottom of the bearing. At the sides there is very little friction and the rollers tend to slip wherever friction is reduced. This is a rig for testing disc brakes. We're going to use it to show you one effect of friction. Apply the brakes at 1500 revs. The temperature of the disc is beginning to rise. That's because of friction. Repeated applications of the brake raise the temperature more and more. Eventually, the brake pads get so hot, they catch fire. In some cutting operations, you can see the same effect. This lathe was specially set up to show what can happen if you cut dry. The excessive heat has completely destroyed the tool tip. Cutting dry can have another effect, as you can see in this high-speed film. Friction causes material to build up on the face of the cutting tool, changing the rake angle and shortening the life of the tool. And here's something you may have done yourself. turning against a dead center and using no grease. Friction between the rapidly spinning work and the dead center has generated so much heat that the tip has actually welded to the work. We repeated the entire cutting operation, putting grease between the center and the work. A 
and this time we also used a coolant. Quite a dramatic change. Coolants and cutting fluids are used to conduct away the heat which friction tends to generate. They also protect the tool tip and the surface finish of the work. But sometimes the heating effect of friction can be used to advantage, in friction welding, for example. The join is completely invisible. This specimen bar shows a number of different metals which have been joined together by friction welding. Another effect of friction is wear. You can see the wear marks on the teeth of these gear wheels. And here's another scar on a machine tool slideway. This can spoil the rigidity of the machine. This rig shows how wear on moving surfaces is affected by load. The scar is simply due to the weight of the rig, but now if we increase the load, the scar is deepened. This situation looks pretty similar. But can you think why this hard stylus doesn't wear a groove in the soft material of the disc? On this milling machine, we've set up a meter to measure the power consumed during the cutting operation. As the cutter clears the work, the power consumption drops. Now it's no longer cutting, but it's still using up a lot of power. And here's the reason. Power is used up in overcoming the friction between all the gear wheels which drive the cutter. That's why we call friction the enemy of efficiency. Heat, wear and power loss are three effects of friction which engineers must always take into account for the efficient running of any machine. Thank <laughs> you.